I was asked to speak about gender inequality in connection with um, uh, peace and security issues. And, um, you know, I had initially come up with this title of Women, Peace, and Security, What Are the Connections? What Are the Limitations? Um, I uh, sent an earlier version uh, of this, um, uh, what will eventually be a paper, to um, a friend and colleague from the Women's Stats Project, Alison Brisk. And um, she suggested that I change the subtitle, at the very least, to a feminist critique of militarism. Um, and, um, you know, I might do that, actually, because um, most of the, uh, um, the discussion is really um, about the problems of militarism um, and their connection with gender inequality, with conflict and war. So uh, let me begin then. Um, conflict situations significantly impact women's lives, especially of those living in impoverished or patriarchal settings. We have heard of far too many heart-rending stories about displacement, family separation, kidnappings, rapes, sexual slavery, death and destruction. At the same time, women play important roles in peace movements peace initiatives, and post-conflict reconstruction, a reality that was recognized in Security Council Resolution 1325, even though in many situations women's roles are defined by others and their voices are marginalized or relegated to the periphery. As conflicts and wars continue to spread across the globe and wreak more and more havoc in their wake, it is worth asking a number of questions about militarism, masculinities, and gender inequality, which I will proceed to do through a focus on the Middle East and North Africa. So, questions. What is the relationship between peacetime arms sales and military spending on the one hand, and masculinist politics and gendered conflicts on the other? How does the existing interstate system with its features of inequalities, hierarchies, and rivalries across and within states, encourage conflict. What are the mechanisms by which patriarchy or gender inequality generates conflict and war? And finally, what would a feminist peace look like? So let me first provide a conceptual context for my discussion by referring to some of the key contributions made by feminist scholars to our understanding of women, war, peace, and security. For the most part, I will be referring to contributions by those within the field of feminist international relations, popularly known as feminist IR, but I also include uh, my own perspectives, um, which are um, inspired also by world systems analysis. So first, um, feminist scholars have questioned the supposed non-existence and irrelevance of women in international security politics, engendering or exposing the workings of gender and power in international relations. Studies by people whose names are up there, Spike Peterson, Charlotte Hooper, um, uh, Ann Tickner, and others, entail the recovery of women's experiences, the recognition of gender-based exclusion from decision-making, and the investigation of women's invisibility in theories of the interstate system and of international relations. As a result also of sociological analyses of gender as a, social, as a structural feature of inequality, and I refer here to works by my sociological colleagues, Joan Acker, Cynthia Epstein, Judith Lorber, and uh, many others since then. And of course, in the wake of um, feminist IR studies, we now accept that gender cuts through world politics and state institutions. Second, the uh, feminist um, peace and security approach questions the extent to which women are secured by state protection in times of war and peace. There are two aspects uh, to this point that I wish to underscore. First, the false idea that women are always safe 
during times of peace. This is what Cynthia Coburn has referred to as the continuum of violence. And secondly, that war is an aberration rather than politics by other means, or more precisely, hegemonic politics by other means, given the nature of the contemporary world system. In other words, when the state expends large amounts of financial and human resources on weapons, purchases, or production, there is a cost to be paid in terms of social spending, including programs for women's security within the home, the workplace, and on the streets. And that state's militarism is directly and indirectly complicit in women's insecurity. Third, the feminist peace and security approach contests discourses wherein women are linked unreflectively with peace, arguing that the identification of women with peace should be balanced by recognition of the participation, support, and inspiration that women have given to war making. This too is an important point to remember, especially in connection with point two regarding hegemonic war making. Although it is true that most violence, conflict, and war are planned and conducted by men, a reality that is reflective of hegemonic or hypermasculinity, it is also true that in many countries, including liberal democratic ones, women in senior political positions may be complicit in the decision to wage war, thus harming women and their children in other countries. Fourth, gendered security practices must address both women and men, be cognizant of unbalanced power relations at home and abroad, and acknowledge the interrelated nature of gendered security. So men as well as women may be opposed to conflict and war as well as be damaged by it, and the security for women and men at home cannot be achieved by means of the insecurity of women and men elsewhere. Fifth, uh, building on Johann Galtung's thesis on how structural violence and cultural violence can lead to con uh, conflict, on Ted Gurr's work on relative deprivation, discrimination, and intrastate violence, and on Paul Collier's work on economic factors and greed as uh, generating civil conflict, Feminist scholars such as Mary Caprioli and Valerie Hudson have empirically examined the relationship between patriarchy and gender inequality on the one hand, and the propensity for civil conflict and interstate conflict on the other. They argue that higher levels of gender inequality correlate with civil conflict, and they conclude that gender equality is necessary both for women's physical security and for world peace. <clears throat> so I'm also part of the Women's Stats Project, which is a team of researchers and also a database um, that is available. I, I have the, um, uh, the URL um, listed up there. And um, the, um, the arguments are that the degree of, of equality of women within countries is the best predictor of how peaceful or conflict-ridden those countries are. Um, especially prone to conflict are countries with what Valerie Hudson and colleagues have called clan governance. I'm not terribly comfortable with that term, but there you go. Um, uh, those countries are uh, more likely to choose force rather than uh, diplomacy to resolve conflict. Um, but also some democracies where gender equality um, is less advanced than it should be are more prone to use violence and militarism as a means to resolve tensions rather than um, diplomacy. So the argument is that increasing gender equality is expected to have cascading effects on security, stability, and resilience within a country as well as internationally. All right, so let's um, take some of those conceptual um, insights that I've just la uh, laid out and um, apply them to the Middle East and North Africa region. First, let's remind ourselves 
of um, the area that we're talking about, but also quite a number of those countries um, are experiencing ongoing conflicts, some of them old and some of them new, excuse me. Of course, there's the Israel-Palestine conflict over long, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Yemen. Most recently, there is serious contention between the alliance of the USA, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates on the one hand, and Iran on the other. Whatever one thinks of the Iranian regime, and that regime cannot be worse than the Saudi regime, the Trump administration's withdrawal of the JCPOA, the nuclear agreement, was a move away from dialogue and diplomacy to contention and um, hopefully not uh, war. So this takes me to the nature of the interstate system. Its hierarchies, uh, inequalities and lack of respect for state sovereignty. We've heard um, a number of perspectives and approaches to this question um, yesterday, um, and here you're going to learn of my perspective. There is, of course, a long history of US and European intervention in Middle Eastern affairs, most of it entirely for raison d'etat, rather than for the well-being of citizens, prosperity of nations, or peace and stability. From the Balfour Declaration and the Sykes-Picot Treaty to the 2011 NATO bombing of Libya, Western interest in the region's geopolitics and its oil has included the 1953 coup d'etat against Premier Mohammad Mossadegh of Iran, the 1956 Suez Crisis and attack on Egypt by the UK, France, and Israel, the region as a pawn in the Cold War between the two superpowers, the, dis the disastrous invasion and occupation of Iraq in 2003, followed by the Libya fiasco, the decision to try to topple Assad in Syria, and the sale of weapons to Saudi Arabia used to practically destroy Yemen and create what is now agreed uh, to be the world's worst humanitarian crisis. There are other ongoing conflicts in the world, elsewhere in the world, some of them the legacy of colonialism, others the result of poverty or income inequality generating the misery of people who have then turned to rebel groups, and some of those uh, groups are legitimate, yet many are led by greedy and opportunistic men enabled by gender inequality and seeking power. And all such conflicts are fueled by the global arms flow. So um, let's look at um, a little closely at um, the arms flow and state military expenditures in the Middle East. But first, um, <clears throat> this is what the Arab Spring looked like in the summer of 2011. I'll get to that in a moment. Military spending has been very high in um, the MENA region over many years. The high rate of military spending may be associated with rivalries and competition among MENA countries, but it is also a function of alliances with the United States, Britain, and France from where arms are largely purchased. Can you all see that map well? Because that is, um, you know, some have written about the modest harvest of the Arab Spring um, and, uh, you know, it's, there's also a very um, disastrous um, harvest, too, um, in terms of the conflicts that then broke out in uh, the region almost immediately afterwards. Um, Tunisia was more or less spared, except that Tunisia did experience violence and jihadism because of the now porous border um, with Libya once the Libyan uh, state um, fell. Um, okay, so military spending, I argue, is associated with the contemporary world system and its feature of hegemonic power and interests. When military expenditures take up a large amount of GDP or of government revenue, this is indicative of the masculinist nature of the state and its propensity for violence. Elsewhere, I have argued 
that those Arab countries with high military spending experienced more violence during and after the Arab Spring protests, i.e. Egypt, Syria, Yemen, or they inflicted violence elsewhere, Saudi Arabia's intervention in Bahrain in 2011 and in Yemen since 2015. Empirical studies show that high military spending is also associated with lower social spending and higher income inequality. For many countries, therefore, government revenue that ought to be going towards programs to improve the quality of schooling and citizen health, to expand the social infrastructure in order to employ more women or to generate more jobs for young people is misallocated toward the purchase of weapons from the US, UK, and France. So as you can see in this table, uh, military spending in 2010, i.e. the eve, on the eve of the Arab Spring, was higher than health spending in Egypt, Morocco, Syria, and Yemen. Only Tunisia and Bahrain, and remember that Bahrain um, has much greater per capita wealth, um, only these countries had relatively high spending on health. Yemen's figures are especially problematical given that it was the poorest country in the region. To put the figures on military spending in a global and comparative perspective, countries deemed to be at medium and low human development as defined by the UNDP and as characteristic of most Arab countries had an average military expenditure of 2% of GDP in 2010. The Arab countries as a whole spent 5.5% of their GDP on the military. And that compares to a low of 1.4% of GDP in Latin America and the Caribbean. At the time, the US's own military spending consumed um, almost 5%, 4.8% of GDP. Tunisia, therefore, was on a par with Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as such countries as Czech Republic, 1.4% of GDP, and Spain, 1% of GDP. So this is a, a more expansive and um, updated uh, table on military spending. Uh, compare, oh, I'm sorry, you can't see the, t yeah. I tried to squeeze in too much in, into this table. Um, so this is uh, military spending as a percentage of GDP, and then in parentheses is as a percentage of um, government spending or you know, public expenditure. Um, the second column, it's health as a percentage of GDP, and in parentheses the figures are um, proportion of um, public spending, total public spending. And the last one is education. <clears throat> So there's some missing data, um, especially for 2017, but the figures are frankly quite alarming, especially in a uh, global um, perspective. So I've highlighted Tunisia because you can see that it's the only country here that seems to be doing well. You know, low military spending and um, you know, rather good levels of spending on health and education. To put this in um, a comparative, a global comparative perspective, um, the world figures military spending as percentage of GDP, 2.5 in uh, 2010, 2.2 in um, 2017, et cetera, et cetera. For MENA, it's 4.8. In 2017, 5.7, et cetera. Only Tunisia does well. Only Tunisia does well. So, um, and the figures, the data for Israel, oh, in the previous one, there we go. The data for Israel does not include the military assistance agreement signed at the end of the Obama administration in 2017 for a transfer of $38 billion in weaponry from the US to Israel over a 10 year period. So um, indeed, studies show that the US is by 
far the largest arms supplier in the world, with domestic manufacturers selling more than $23.7 billion in weapons in 2014 to nearly 100 different countries. During the Obama administration, weapons sales surged to record levels, in large part due to huge shipments to those Gulf countries with their very high military spending, particularly Saudi Arabia. The weapons sales to Saudi Arabia include cluster bombs and other munitions uh, currently being used to hit densely populated areas, schools, and even a camp for displaced people in Yemen. Many of the U.S. arms sales, especially to Israel and Egypt, are heavily subsidized by us, the taxpayer. Congress has approved all of this, perhaps because of the approximately $150 million a year the defense industry spends on lobbying and direct campaign contributions. There are other countries guilty of these arms flows, um, mainly the, US, uh, the UK and France. So the figures on military spending in, mili in uh, the Middle East and North Africa and the massive flow of weapons out of the US bring to mind Pope Francis's admonition to the US Congress during his visit in 2015. And here I quote, here we have to ask ourselves, why are deadly weapons being sold to those who plan to inflict untold suffering on individuals and society? Sadly, the answer, as we all know, is simply for money. Money that is drenched in blood, often innocent blood. In the face of this shameful and culpable silence, it is our duty to confront the problem and to stop the arms trade." Unquote. In late 2017, members of the European Parliament renewed their calls for an EU arms embargo against Saudi Arabia following allegations that the country is breaching international humanitarian law in Yemen. This may have something to do with the fact that the European uh, Parliament has a relatively high proportion of women, 37%, um, many of whom represent left-wing parties. By early 2018, however, only Germany, Norway, and the Walloon region of Belgium had decided to halt the arms flow to Saudi Arabia. In September, last month, uh, the Spanish government decided to halt its sale of so-called precision bombs to Saudi Arabia, the result of activist demands as well as knowledge of the scale of the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. Will other EU member states follow suit? The male-dominated European Commission has issued humanitarian appeals and allocated humanitarian aid funds for Yemen, but it has not called on member states to stop the arms flow. So the crisis of um, Syria and other countries in the region, the outflow of Syrian refugees was caused by external intervention in what began as a domestic civil conflict, which internationalized, exacerbated, and prolonged the crisis. The plight of Iraqi Yazidi women who experienced unspeakable crimes by ISIS occurred because of Syria's destabilization and more directly because of the continued instability in Iraq years after the US-UK invasion of 20, uh, 2003. And the humanitarian crisis in Yemen, the deaths of so many children by bombardments or cholera, is the result of bombing assaults by Saudi and United Arab Emirate fighter planes with weapons, again, supplied by the US uh, and UK, among other countries. And even in Yemen, the 2011 NATO intervention and civil war deeply affect not only the Yemeni people themselves, but the lives of those African migrants who had spent years working and living in Libya. The violence in Libya uprooted 
migrant lives and compelled many to travel elsewhere within Africa, mostly but not exclusively to their countries of origin. Those who stayed or arrived after the con uh, crisis in what had become a lawless country faced instead hardship and exploitation which left women particularly vulnerable. Numerous reports by journalists as well as humanitarian organizations highlight the plight of African women constantly subjected to sexual exploitation in Libya. Many try to make the perilous journal, journey to Europe and they often fail. So world systems and Marxist theorists offer differing but complementary perspectives on the larger causes, implications, and consequences of those interventions, conflicts, and wars. Some emphasize um, the new imperialism, that's David Harvey, uh, while others point to the historic decline of US global hegemony resulting in intensified rivalry and competition among core and some newly empowered semi-peripheral countries over raw materials and other resources, as well as the emergence of deadly new non-state actors. So in summary, ours is a chaotic world characterized by, again, a continuum of violence from micro-level gender relations to macro politics. I want to end on a happy note, on an optimistic note, if not happy. So can we look forward to a feminist peace? And what would it look like? A world of gendered security. So the obstacles to peace and security are formidable. <clears throat> an unjust interstate and global economic system, that massive arms flow that um, I told you about, hypermasculinity, patriarchy. The persistence of violence against women is both a causal mechanism and an effect of conflict and armed violence. If we cannot yet change the world system, can we begin to address war, security, and peace by enhancing the status of women across the globe? Can steps to achieve gender equality help end men's propensity for violence and states' propensity for war? The answer would be yes, if we agreed that war, peace, and security have, in fact, very much to do with raising women's legal status and expanding their social positions, with strong laws, norms, and enforcement regarding violence against women and girls, with women's visibility, influence, and presence in the public sphere and public space across all occupations and professions and levels of decision making, and with well-funded pro-women policies and programs in state agencies and in civil society. These are the minimalist requisites for a feminist peace. As the Women's Stats Project insists, women's subordination and gender inequality are stronger predictors of conflict and war than is national wealth or even democracy. Uh, in fact, democracy is not a panacea. It may be true that democracies do not wage war on each other, that so-called democratic peace thesis, but they do wage war on other countries or they engage in deliberate state destabilization or overtly or covertly arm rebels with the effect that they do, in fact, engage in war making. If democracy, then, is not the prerequisite for a peaceful world, and even a realist like Stephen Walt has argued that uh, US liberal hegemony has failed, we need to think of other alternatives. We might, for example, examine countries in the world where military spending is low, where women's status is relatively high, and the state does not engage in war making. 
For that, we might look at countries such as Costa Rica, Sweden, and Tunisia as models. A few words about Tunisia. In my previous work on explaining the divergent outcomes of the Arab Spring, I asked why Tunisia was the only country that avoided violence, civil conflict, or authoritarian reversal, and instead embarked upon a democratic transition. I compared Tunisia with Bahrain, Egypt, Libya, Syria, and Yemen, and I found that Tunisia had two advantages over the other countries. First was a more gender egalitarian society with strong women's rights organizations and very strong laws protecting women, along with the absence of foreign intervention. In turn, these factors were associated with modern political institutions, a robust civil society, and as we saw, very low military spending. Such conditions were not present in the other countries. Tunisia has experienced difficult economic conditions in the years since its political revolution, but it remains a peaceful country with a strong and robust civil society including well-established feminist organizations and feminist intellectuals who make their voices heard on an array of government, civic, and regional mat matters, and who are included on presidential commissions and other types of decision-making bodies. At the global level, we have seen the steady presence of women in peace movements as critics of militarism and war and as as advocates for peace and human security. One of the world's oldest peace organizations is WILF, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, founded in, 20, in, in 1915 by 1,300 women activists from Europe and North America who were opposed to what became known as the Great War and later World War I. In mid-century, women formed groups such as Women's Strike for Peace in the US, and in the former socialist countries, the Women's International Democratic Federation, both of them called for the easing of tensions between the superpowers, an end to the nuclear arms race, and peaceful coexistence. In 1981, um, British feminist peace activists formed the Women of Greenham Common Peace Camp to oppose the presence of cruise missiles. They stayed until the year 2000. In the latter part of the 20th century, and in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet bloc, a new wave of conflicts in Afghanistan, Bosnia, and Central Africa involved serious human rights violations against women. In response, new networks emerged, such as Women in Black, Medica Mondiale, Women Waging Peace, and Women for Women International. They underscored the specific vulnerability of women and girls during wartime, the pervasive nature of sexual abuse, and the need to include women's voices in peace negotiations. They also produced research to show that women's groups had been effective in peace building in Northern Ireland, as well as in Bosnia and um, uh, Liberia. In the new century, US-led wars in Afghanistan and Iraq galvanized women across the globe to support existing peace organizations and to build new ones. In 2002, a new group was the US-based Code Pink, Women for Peace, whose mission statement identifies it as, quote, a woman-initiated grassroots peace and social justice movement working to end the war in Iraq, stop new wars, and redirect our resources into healthcare, education, and other life-affirming activities. Who in the audience has heard of Code Pink or has seen them in action? <laughs> a few of you have, that. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, so you'll know that um, Code Pink is, um, there was one article about them that uh, referred to them as the new mothers of invention, uh, <laughs> which is a terrific article and it echoes back to Frank Zappa's um, <laughs> um, album um, and, and his group. Um, Code Pink is famous for, for its creative but nonviolent use of direct action to raise uh, public awareness and put pressure on officials to um, enact change. 
And these um, actions include sit-ins, street theater, marches, blockades, and other forms of um, political protests. Um, so it's a nonviolent form of you know, what is known as action direct. <laughs> um, its current work includes a, uh, campaigns to block weapons sales to Saudi Arabia, advocate for Palestinian human rights, and divest from the war economy to reinvest in local peace economies. And to this end, it works with the major peace organizations in the US, such as Peace Action, and with women's groups across the globe. Code Pink is also part of the organizing team for the um, upcoming uh, Women's March on the Pentagon, which is taking place this Sunday, um, along with other groups such as um, the Canadian um, Voice of Women for Peace and um, the US Green Party. Um, the Nobel Women's Initiative. In 2007, six women Nobel Peace Prize winners, including Iran's Shirin Ebadi, formed the Nobel Women's Initiative with a view towards ending militarism and conflicts and bringing about peace and stability in the Middle East, Africa, and elsewhere. The two, the two uh, Northern Irish um, women peace builders were also among the um, founders. Um, I very much hope that Nadia Morad, who was uh, you know, the Yazidi woman who was the co-winner of the um, 2018 um, a Nobel Peace Prize, along with the very impressive Dr. Dennis Mukwege. I hope that she joins this group too, and I fully expect her to do so. Um, in Israel, the women-led Maxim Watch, whose main activity is to monitor checkpoints, continues to oppose the occupation and call for negotiations and peace. Another group worth mentioning is the Marche Mondiale des Femmes, launched in the year 2000 by the Fédération des Femmes du Québec, a feminist organization based in Quebec. The group sprang from the Women's March Against Poverty in 1995 in Quebec, which involved about 2,500 women marching for 10 days before presenting nine demands to the authorities relating to economic justice. Today, the Marche Mondiale takes the strong position that the combination of poverty, patriarchy, militarism, and violence against women generate both economic injustice and armed conflicts. So over the years, feminist, global feminist advocacy on violence against women has succeeded in effecting some policy changes. There was, for example, the insertion of important items in the final Vienna Declaration of the 1993 Conference on Human Rights such as the assertion that violence against women was an abuse of human rights. And that agreement also objected to the harmful effects of certain traditional or customary practices, cultural prejudice, and ex uh, religious extremism. The declaration also stated that human rights abuses of women in situations of armed conflict, including systematic rape, sexual slavery, and forced pregnancy were violations of the fundamental principles of international human rights and human rights law. What is interesting about this, the background is really interesting because it was gender experts within the UN agency of UNIFEM working with some of those transnational feminist networks that I have studied and, and um, uh, written about um, they held informal meetings with members of the UN's uh, Security Council to advocate for a resolution, the first of its kind, um, on women, peace, and security. Thus, um, in October of the year 2000, the UN Security Council issued Resolution 1325 on gender, peace, and security, calling on governments as well as the um, UN Security Council itself uh, to include women uh, in negotiations and settlements with respect to uh, conflict resolution and peace building. Um, at the same time, the Rome Statute, which established the International Criminal Court, um, was influenced by the lobbying efforts of the Women's Caucus for Gender Justice. And the statute governs administration of the ICC, including the gender-balanced recruitment of judges, 
and mandates appointment of gender specialists, including those with expertise on violence against women and children. And as we know, and as everyone in this room, I believe, knows, the US has elected not to join the ICC, uh, no doubt because its officials would be um, held accountable. Um, most recently, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom held its Congress in Accra, Ghana, just this past August, with statements issued about the state of the world, its conflicts, and the conditions of women. Solidarities across borders were forged, and commitments were made to fight poverty, violence against women, and war. We can look to such women's peace organizations for inspiration and leadership while also recognizing that the violent, militarist actions of states can be diminished through the steady march of women's progress towards equality, inclusion, and empowerment. Although, as I said earlier, women in political leadership positions have been complicit in waging war, there is also a great deal of research suggesting that expanding women's presence in politics increases the amount of attention given to social welfare, legal protection, and transparency in government and in business. It's important to recognize, however, that political empowerment, that level of political empowerment, is just the end of a longer process of ensuring that girls and women are elevated from poverty given quality schooling and health care, guaranteed full and legal equality, provided with the means to earn and control income and assets, and guaranteed bodily integrity and dignity. As the physical security of women and girls improves across countries, their overall empowerment may indeed lead to the profound cultural, economic, and political changes necessary to end the world's conflicts and bring about a world of peace and security for all. Thank you. I'll leave that alone. Uh, sure. Thank you so much for that very comprehensive coverage of what's happening with women, especially in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, at this time, we just to remind you, there's a microphone in the middle of the floor here. Uh, if those of you who have questions, please would line up and address your questions to Dr. Moradam. Of course, I may have covered every single aspect of the issue. No, you'll get, we'll get. May I start with a question? By all means. Um, I think one of the challenges that women have is that historically they have never, they have come into a system of patriarchy. And I'm just wondering in your uh, research and in your uh, views, how do you envision uh, women eventually being able to change that system over time? They have been changing. Would you like to come oh, up here? Oh. Actually, there are different feminist theories about um, patriarchy, its evolution, its trajectory, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, there is one uh, thesis that argues that we have made this shift from what Denise Candiotti and um, John Caldwell, the demographer, actually called classic patriarchy, you know, the rule of the father within the home, um, towards a more kind of public patriarchy. Um, where state institutions and um, certain you know, companies, businesses, corporations, um, various types of organizations are also male-dominated. Um, but in that shift from classic patriarchy to public patriarchy, um, that shift was made, in fact, possible by the advancement of women through access to education and employment and so on. And so it's in that so that environment of public patriarchy that then these kinds of women can make certain demands um, for, uh, for change and, and transformation and so on. But we are in, still in a kind of um, uh, you know, public patriarchal world in which men still rule and men control most of the wealth as well. 
And that has been increasing, actually, since um, actually the neoliberal era. Um, you know, women's proportion of, um, uh, of, of earned income should really have been equal by now. Um, and in some public sectors, it is more or less equal. But because of the importance of the private sector and because in particular of the dominance of finance in recent decades, and most of those billionaire financiers are men, that wage gap has not narrowed as much as it should. Um, so women's access uh, to wealth as well as political power um, is still a, um, um, a reflection of the kind of public patriarchy that continues um, in our in our world. Um, Sylvia Walby has a very interesting um, notion of public patriarchy in um, Western countries, and she argues that there are two models. Um, there's a social democratic model and a neoliberal model. And in the social democratic model, women do better. Um, and again, if you think of the Nordic countries and some other um, countries where certain types of social democratic politics and social policy um, uh, reign, um, women do well on a range of, of indicators. Um, the neoliberal model of public patriarchy in the Western uh, uh, camp, so to speak, is, for example, you know, represented by the United States, uh, Britain as well, but the United States, uh, where actually women do less well than um, other uh, women in Western countries, and actually less well than a few women in semi-peripheral or developing countries, especially on, sur surprisingly, uh, but maybe people in this um, audience uh, already know about this, on some measures like maternal mortality um, and, um, and infant and child mortality. I mean, that should not be happening in a country like the United States. Uh, which is the richest country in the globe and you know, certainly the most powerful. So on those measures, the United States does not do very well, and so gender equality is less advanced in the United States than it is in um, some of the other countries. And I suppose that's also why folks like you know, Valerie and Mary and others argue that democracy is not a panacea, and in particular, those democratic countries where women do not do as well as in some other countries, those democratic countries have a propensity to solve um, you know, disputes and such through violent means. Um, and I think we can understand American foreign policy to some extent um, through this lens of patriarchy. Um, you know, I mean, you know, there are other ways of understanding American foreign policy as well, but um, this is you know, a, uh, a very um, strong feminist argument, um, the role of patriarchy and gender inequality in um, state um, action. Please come up to the Maud. There we go. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just wondering how we deal with and how you deal with the women, many, many women who don't have the same perspective. So how do we educate women, for example, that voted for Trump's policy, which is very militaristic, <laughs> or women that vote for Brexit, and yeah. how do we actually get around that problem if, if women aren't recognizing themselves this issue? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a great question, Maud. And it's, um, it's a tricky um, you know, uh, political uh, question, too. Um, of course, you know, the easy answer is, well, false consciousness. Um, but I don't think it's that. Um, I think that, um, uh, that we have to understand, rather than judge, um, the women who voted for Trump um, or those who follow Orban in Hungary and uh, you know, the, the new populist regime in, um, in Poland. Um, um, and, um, and I think there are very real, or the people in the UK who voted for Brexit. I mean, I think there are very real reasons why you know, people have chosen that path. And I think that rather than judging them and uh, exacerbating the polarized um, you know, conditions in uh, various countries, that you know, we have to try to understand and we have to meet them halfway. I mean, actually, uh, you know, I've done a little bit of work on uh, the rise of you know, right-wing populist uh, movements, and I've looked a little bit at um, you know, women's responses to, uh, to right-wing um, and their adherence to right-wing populist movements, too. And their concerns, in part, 
our concerns that even some liberals and leftists can understand. For example, economic marginalization. For example, the very fact that uh, liberal uh, governments and regimes have simply ignored them for many decades, for at least three decades. Um, and I think that is something that we have to recognize. Um, I believe very strongly that we should not, um, uh, we should not, uh, you know, allow, allow. <laughs> uh, we should not let women like that, including religious women, to be captured by the right. We've got to build bridges and we've got to talk to them. And so I was actually a little dismayed uh, when the huge January march uh, that took place um, in the wake of the Trump um, presidential victory did not allow uh, religious women, in particular self-declared anti-abortion feminists, to take part. I thought that was a mistake. Uh, because if anyone can talk to um, women on the fence with religious values and so on, it's precisely these sorts of religious women who could do that. And we should be building bridges with them rather than excluding them from, uh, from our conversations, from our activities. Not everybody shares this view, Maud, as you probably know, um, but I'm more of the build, bridge builder. I mean, in my previous work, um, on sort of Muslim women, I have really strongly promoted Islamic feminists. That's different from the Islamist women, but Islamic feminists are the ones who uh, can build those bridges and bring more women from the Islamist side to um, a more expansive feminist vision and a progressive vision. Yeah, thanks. I, I just wanted, to, I have a question, um, actually two questions. Um, the first is, um, you know, in developing countries, um, women have a different perspective on the women's movement than in Western countries. In fact, there's a, there's a bit of a backlash right now against some of the Western scholars, Eurocentric, North American-centric scholars who are feminists. Not mine, I hope. <laughs> I hope not. But coming from coming from developing countries, and, and uh, how do you respond to their to their criticisms that mm -hmm. the Western approach is is, is very very um, skewed and, and uh, doesn't really reflect what's happening in Africa and Asia and many of the developing world? And the second question has to do with since you have worked within the United Nations, uh, one has to be bothered by the fact that we still haven't had a UN Secretary General uh, that's that right, is a woman yeah. after all these years yeah. of pushing for women's equality um, uh, within the UN system. Uh, there is no such thing uh, at, the, at the upper echelons of the organization. And what do you think is responsible for that? Uh, we've had some very successful women run for that position, but never yeah, seem to be able to get over the hump. Yeah, that's true, yes. Um, I think that Guterres is doing a pretty good job um, considering you know, the con constraints that he has. But personally, I was for Irina Bokova. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I mean, I thought she had a terrific background and uh, she was the, um, she was the um, secretary general, uh, the director general of UNESCO after my departure from UNESCO and I thought she did a much, much better job than uh, the previous uh, Japanese guy. Um, <laughs> the, um, about your first question, um, Andy, you know, there isn't one Western feminism, actually. I think the critique of, um, and the legitimate critique on the part of many uh, women from developing countries is really about a certain interpretation and implementation of feminism uh, that comes from the West, and I think it's that, um, oh, dare I say, a certain type of liberal feminism <laughs> that basically says this is what we have done in the United States and in the UK and in France and what have you, and that's, you have to follow exactly this path. Um, and, you know, there is a criticism of that kind of liberalism, um, and, uh, uh, and uh, I think it's quite legitimate. Look, early on in the um, second wave feminist movement, there were different 
types of feminism that were identified. There was lib uh, liberal feminism, there was cultural feminism, there was socialist feminism, there was Marxist feminism. Right? Um, and then what became dominant and hegemonic in the United States, arguably, was liberal feminism, you know, which basically said, okay, you know, this is the system in, let's say, the United States, and we'll take it and we'll try to have some, you know, equal opportunity laws here and there, but, you know, they had lost that more expansive, transformative vision of the early years of second wave feminism, which was reflected in uh, the visions of, let's say, cultural feminists, as well as radical and, um, and socialist and Marxist feminists. So, for example, the United States does not have statutory paid maternity leave. Well, that was one of the goals, and it was on the agenda in the early 1970s, actually through the 1970s, into the 1980s. Pat Schroeder tried to you know, push for it um, in Congress. It didn't go anywhere, and so the National Organization for Women and the dominant American uh, liberal women's organization decided to abandon it in favor of reproductive rights and abortion rights for women, which is important, but you know, these were not mutually exclusive. So there's a certain type of feminism that is also a kind of, dare I say, imperial feminism that, uh, you know, women in developing countries might also um, be very wary of. So that kind of imperial feminism might be the feminist uh, version of, let's say, oh, Tony Blair's humanitarian intervention thesis. And so to the extent that developing uh, country women are opposed to that type of Western feminism, that's actually a legitimate complaint. But they are not opposed to this idea that there should be women's empowerment, there should be equality, that uh, you know, human rights, well, should be applied in their country in general and to them as well. And we find, I mean, I've been doing this work for quite some time, we find feminist movements and organizations in every single country. And yes, sometimes the d discourses differ, sometimes the priorities differ, sometimes the agenda is a little bit different, the strategies may be different, but they all have a critique of male dominance, of authoritarianism, and of women's subordination in the family and at other levels too. That's a feminism. But what they don't like is being told what to do by outsiders. And that's a legitimate, I think, grievance. Um, yeah. I, I was wondering if, in sort of following up on some of the questions er, earlier, um, whether you have any comments on Christian, Christian Gotzi's work about the feminist movements in Eastern Europe during the, the uh, Soviet era, you know, she sort of makes this argument that there was a, that there would be a third type, not just social democratic and neoliberal oh. um, uh, responses to public patriarchy, mm -hmm. but there was the Eastern European way of doing it, uh -huh. which was to actually get right, right, right. the uh, things that were yeah. some of these early <laughs> demands of second wave, wave feminism in, mm -hmm. in inside, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. she also argues that. Mm -hmm. We have, we, those of us scholars who kind of look at these things in the UN system, mm -hmm. have misunderstood mm -hmm. what happened with the development of links between the global north and global south mm -hmm. in feminist movements. And actually, the, the really key links were uh, southeast, not mm -hmm. southwest. Mm -hmm. And as someone who's a Radcliffe Fellow and therefore knows all of the way in which all of the archives at the Schlesinger Library mm -hmm. doesn't seem to include anything from the global, or little from the global south and nothing from the former Soviet world, I yeah. kind of find her argument very, very compelling. Right, absolutely. And, and, it, and I just and wonder if you have any comment on that. Yeah. Fair point. Um, you know, I mean, just in defense of, of uh, you know, of Sylvia's work, um, she is, um, she is referring to the Western, the OECD countries, you know, so the contemporary welfare states of, um, of the OECD. But what is also true is that a lot of um, feminist history and feminist um, theorizing has ignored what went on in the former socialist countries, um, or they um, dismiss it 
as you know, a top-down, um, you know, crude form of, of feminism that um, you know that 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 uh, you know dissipated and was rejected by women later on, and so on. So there are these you know these problematical areas. I did mention one organization, the International Federation of Democratic Women. Yeah, that was actually a very big organization, and that was an example of your Southeast cooperation because many of the uh, women's groups that formed in the 1970s um, uh, in particular um, had very good ties with the um, International uh, Federation of Democratic Women and attended these annual meetings that they would have too. Um, it is no accident that a number of um, um, feminist organizations that were formed in Middle East um, countries and in a few uh, you know, Asian countries too in the 1970s and 1980s had the term democratic in their title because they were also associated with um, you know, this particular wing of you know, uh, global feminism. Now, so there were um, you know, these Southeast ties, but also very interesting are the South-South ties that, um, that uh, you know, I've, I've, I've written a great deal about too in terms of these transnational feminist networks that emerged uh, you know, largely in the 1980s and brought together um, you know, women from various um, mostly developing countries um, around certain uh, you know, issues uh, and themes like you know, structural adjustment or women's human rights, anti-fundamentalism and so on and so forth. So that South-South connection was very, very extensive, and I've written a great deal about that, uh, but the Southeast has been less uh, studied, um, but it is, you know, it's, it's very, very important. You know, the feminists, in fact, here's a little trivia for you. Um, the feminist organizations that emerged in um, a lot of third world countries actually came out of the left, but that's not so surprising, because even in the United States, um, a lot of the early feminist groupings came out of the left-wing student movement, you know, um, as well as the civil rights movement. And so they came from other movements where they recognized either that they were second-class citizens or that, you know, there was more work to be done, which couldn't be done within the parameters of, you know, those other organizations. But what they did was bring those organizational skills, <laughs> those conceptual skills and so on, to the feminist organizations. I've studied the um, Arab ones very, very closely. And, well, I mean, I know that the Iranian ones came from the left because I was part of that movement too. I mean, I know that just from firsthand. But I've, I've uh, studied the Arab ones too, and their organizational skills really came right out of those left-wing movements that they had been a part of. Um, anyway, so that's in part why some of these transnational feminist networks that then formed in the 1980s and became very, very active in the 1990s were so very effective. That's my book, Globalizing Women, Transnational Feminist Networks, and also the Globalization and Social Movements book, the chapter on global feminism. Uh, two quick comments. I would like to add an example to your list, and that is the movement that started in 2014 after Israel's brutal assault on Gaza, um, Operation Protective Edge, and Israeli and Palestinian women came together and founded this amazing movement called Women Wage Peace. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, so they've been doing this two, in the fall, they've been doing this two week mark from the border of, uh, the north border of Israel down to, to the West Bank, and uh, they've got now tens of thousands of supporters. It's absolutely incredible. And they're calling for, you know, nonviolent peace accords between Israel and Palestine. And uh, I just think it's, it's, it's really inspiring. It doesn't get very much coverage, but there are, you know, thousands of supporters that, that march with the women. And it's a very much, you know, women's-led movement and, and really um, uh, hopeful. And then Thanks I would like that. to just share very quickly a Canadian perspective. It was Canada that led the NATO bombing of Libya. And Canada is selling arms to Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Egypt, and Israel. And in uh, 2017, Canada announced a new defense policy. We're going to be spending so much more on the military to maintain high-level war fighting. This past summer, we, we announced a new defense investment plan. Um, it, and 
uh, you know, in the last 10 years, Canada has had a, you know, a doubling of military spending. Um, and we're a country that still doesn't have a national early learning and child care program. This mm. is the one measure that would really help, help mm. you know, working women. And, yeah, we, right. you know, we still don't, we still don't have, this, have this. But we're going to be, you know, we're building warships. We're going to be buy, buying fighter jets, etc. So you might have heard that Canada recently announced in the, the last year feminist, a feminist foreign policy. Mm. Well, I just want to tell you, well, not to be fooled, it, um, it's very much a, uh, a you know, continued Canadian militarism. Uh, Canada is the 16th highest military spender in the world, and among NATO members, we're, we're six. So the problem that, that you have in the United States is very much the problem we have in Canada, but just at a smaller scale. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, they might learn something from Tunisia. Um, by the way, the uh, Tunisia National Development Plan um, you might find this interesting. The Tunisian National Development Plan includes a plan to expand um, the number of um, creche and preschools. And that is for two purposes. One, for the socialization of, you know, for, for children's access to, um, to preschool. Because in, in a lot of the Arab uh, countries, school begins at, in Iran as well, school begins at age six. You know, and that tends to depress female employment too, female labor force participation. That's one of the reasons why so few working class and lower middle class women actually work. The higher uh, educated women all work, you know, because they can also afford nannies and such. But um, you know, missing from a lot of the labor statistics are working class and lower middle class uh, women. And so Tunisia has this plan in its national development plan 2016 to 2020 to increase um, uh, preschool facilities. This has the um, uh, advantage both of providing this kind of uh, you know, early education for children and employment generation for women. You know, so take that to, uh, <laughs> to your next um, you know, uh, meeting in, in Canada and let them know that uh, they should learn from Tunisia. Let's take one more question, last one, please. Yeah, I really like the way you articulated how to empower women through education politics, the movements, and the institutions. But to what I think is one-sided, we are just talking about women, trying to get the power from the men. And then, I, there's no way I saw men, uh -huh. and I'm wondering how are we going to do this? Supposedly take the power, <clears throat> rather than taking the power, how can we call up men? Mm. How can we win them and mm. be willing to give this power to women? Mm. How mm -hmm. can we have men rising up and saying, we are mm. two uh, wings of a bird. Mm. And if mm -hmm. one wing is stronger than the other, we can get where we want to go. Mm. So how can we yeah. do that? And I'm wondering, do you have a case study yes. with all your traveling and your study where you can tell, we, you might be able to share examples where something like this has worked. The men have taken it as also their duty to try to uh, bridge the gap and bring equality of men and women and yeah mm. so i want mm. you to address that thank oh, you oh gosh thank you thank you um yeah um is women's empowerment a zero-sum game um is it taking power away from men and how do we bring them on board i mean i think that's the perennial question um but it has been done. It has been done. And it has been done um, in a number of different ways. One, it's been done just in terms of this long-term, inevitable, secular trend, whereby if you give women um, access to education, whether deliberately or not, they will start, you will start to find them in, for example, different types of jobs and occupations. And then the research shows that where you have higher levels of women's economic participation, there is a greater likelihood for two things, for women to join different types of organizations, advocacy, et cetera, and also for publics, including men, to increase their confidence in women as equal citizens, and as potential political leaders. So there is this kind of uh, stage, dare I say, um, whereby 
it's almost inevitable that women should. So that was the progress, that was the process in many Western countries. Um, through education and so on, you know, women's labor force participation increased, and then of course they started making certain demands, and then um, they also um, had access to certain types of um, occupations prof and professions, including decision-making ones. In other cases, you have to have affirmative action. I mean, we have had so many cases throughout the world of affirmative action. Affirmative action for minorities, affirmative action for women, affirmative action in India for what was called the scheduled castes. So you have to do it that way as well. Um, so, you know, women can do this longer term process um, but also you, can ha you have to have certain measures and uh, mechanisms in place to ensure that they progress. There will always be resistance. I mean, you know, there's resistance in lots of countries to this, and not just countries like Afghanistan, where, you know, uh, you know women are still um, not doing as well as they should have been doing. Uh, but you have to have allies within the political system and you have to have allies at the local level, too. And that has happened. That has happened. I mean, I've seen that in, for example, Tunisia and Morocco. Uh, I've seen that in Iran. When there are demonstrations and rallies for women's rights in Tunisia, Morocco, and also in Iran, there are always men there. They do not insist that this be only a woman uh, initiative. They have allies. They have male allies whether they're from their own families or from the community or colleagues or school friends or what have you, there will be men who will be supportive of that. So that's what I can say on that subject. Dr. Moradan, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.